there's a difference between clearing your energy and protecting your energy. So you want to clear things out first. And then from there, you want to create a kind of protection around you. Because it doesn't have to be this thing that's just so out there and weird. I think people do things all the time that are quote unquote normal, (laughs) that cleanse and clear. Well, hello there. How are you? This is Christine Marie Mason. It's the Rose Woman Podcast, where every week we talk about a little something that creates more freedom in our lives. Taboo to liberation, as I like to say. This week, we're talking about self-protection rituals and other things with the wonderful Maria Haddad, who wrote a section in the new book, Reverence, on this subject. And I'd like to sort of back up and and say, you know, why do we even need a ritual for self-protection anyway? Self-defense, I can understand. You know, some actual attack is coming at you and you want to wield your pepper spray or, you know, you've got some kind of fancy triple kick headlock thing that you do. But defense is a more active state of being. Self-protection is kind of a way of walking in the world. You know, we, we learn from a very young age our adaptations, and some of those adaptations can be that we're unboundaried, that we're very open and we're always scanning the horizon and giving ourselves a way to uh, take care of others in the field and lose our sense of self. Another can be that we're overboundaried, that we're so tight that we can't let anyone else in because letting people in is dangerous. So... When we're talking about doing protection, it's often for people who are very sensitive and and open when their aura or their field or perceptual field is open and creating a way to basically reclaim your inner core. Uh, The writer Anne Lamott says, no is a complete sentence. And that could be helpful if you're the kind of person for whom no has to be accompanied by a lot of explanations and reasons. So how are you doing with boundaries? Uh, boundaries can be around work, like this is the end of my work day, and it's time to take a break. And that's all there is to say about it done. I'm going for a walk in the woods. It can be around like how much emotional distress you're willing to borrow from other people or financial stress you're willing to borrow from other people. It could be as simple as knowing what's yours to do. As you go through the stages of life, figuring out what's yours to do is sometimes challenging, particularly if you've been raising people and you've been doing a lot for them and sort of gradually releasing that and letting them figure out what is theirs to do. And part of that is you not stepping in and fixing everything. So self-protection. I'm going to read to you a little bit from the book, uh, the introduction to Maria's part And then we'll get into a conversation with her. Are you game? All right. So this is a section of the reverence book. It's in Personal Daily Rituals, and it's called Rituals for Self-Protection. It's from Maria. We are constantly interacting with everything around us on an energetic level. The concept of aura is helpful here. The aura or auric field is the energy of our body where it extends beyond our skin. Our emotions, vitality, and health are all impacted by activity in this auric field. Everything carries with it a resonance. For example, you can feel the difference in your body when someone is judging you and the vibration it reverberates around you versus an experience of unconditional love that is coming at you. Albert Einstein wrote, We are slowed down sound and light waves, a walking bundle of frequencies tuned into the cosmos. We are souls dressed up in sacred biochemical garments and our bodies are the instruments through which our souls play their music. We may not always be conscious of how much we're picking up in our energetic bodies externally from the people and environments around us, as well as our own internalized emotions that are stuck within our field, unable to release. Protecting ourselves is both a matter of clearing, cleansing, and purifying the inner world as well as sealing ourselves off to negative external influences, which is also called shielding. So with that in mind, how do we cleanse? How do we shake off the stuck energy that's in us? And how do we sort of keep ourselves centered and grounded, be open enough to receive connection and be boundaried enough to know when 
we have stepped out of our own center. So please enjoy this conversation with Maria. When I first encountered you professionally, you were a top level designer working in New York City. And to see your migration from that to this, what feels like a pretty big lane change to where you are now and what you're working on um, was curious to me. So can you talk about your own journey? How did you end up writing a ritual for self-protection in this book? It's very interesting. You know, I was living this very go, go, go New York City lifestyle. And, you know, when I was a child, I grew up in a Syrian uh, family and I was I was very sensitive as a kid, and I don't think I lived in a place where that was kind of embraced. So I learned how to really um, kind of squash and hide away that side of myself, that sensitivity. As I got older, I was living this lifestyle in in the city, and I signed up for this six-week meditation course that kind of created this sort of opening back into these sensitivities as a child that I had once forgotten. And I became aware that I was able to sense the emotions of the people around me. You know, empathy, I think, is on a scale. And it was my ability to sense people's emotions was kind of off the charts. And it was a burden in some ways, but in other ways, it was really, it, it was something that really helped me. Um, I was working as an art director and it really helped me with my work, with my creative work to be able to tune in to my clients, to really be able to empathize with what they're looking for and what their needs are in order for me to create those things for them. So it was this kind of gift that I didn't necessarily know how to control, but I knew it really helped me in many ways. And as I got older, I realized that I wasn't necessarily living the most balanced lifestyle and I was getting ill quite often. And it kind of culminated with a diagnosis with um, endometriosis. And I had a extremely painful and challenging surgery and recovery period. And when I was recovering, it almost, um, it really burst open that sensitivity to people's emotional states where I would be walking down the streets of New York and I could hear, I could feel someone's anger in my body. And then I'd go somewhere else and I could feel someone's laughter in my body. And it took a really long time for me to kind of heal that up and understand the importance of energetic hygiene. Yeah, energetic hygiene is a great term. I it's a recent term for me, although I think I've been practicing it uh, subconsciously, like, unintentionally for a long time. But what does energy hygiene mean for someone who has never heard the term before? I see it as the same way. It's something I think a lot of us do unconsciously all the time. It's just putting a word to something most people naturally do. So the same way you would you know, you take a shower and you wash your skin and you wash your hair and you clip your nails and you, you know, you do your laundry and you keep your clothes clean and, you know, all this. It's the same thing, but energetically. So if we are bodies and we have these energy fields around us and it's kind of understanding that our energy fields also need to be cleansed and cleared and Um, protected. And the same way we protect our skin, we wear clothing, we wear jackets. It's kind of the same thing, but it's just working more on an energetic level instead of more physical. Yeah. And if you're out there and you're not big into sort of energy fields or understanding what that means, like you are literally an energy conduit. Your entire body is electrical. All your nervous, that's what the nervous system is. And you project that out from your body. And the you'll notice like if you bring your hands together, that you can feel um, sort of a, a, a presence between your hands and the closer you get, the more dense that presence is. And the same thing when you touch other people. So if you ever are wanting to play with energy, you can do a lot of things to just test like as you approach someone, when do you begin to really feel them and back away and try to get a tactile felt sense of 
of an energy field and know that you have one. You can have people do that to you. Okay. So energy hygiene, we're cleaning it out. What are the practices? Like how do people master both setting energetic boundaries while still being kind of open to connection and love and collaboration and learning? Because you could really close yourself off. And what are your daily practices for taking care of your energy body? It is important to realize this doesn't have to be, and I, I love the example that you used of feeling the energy between your hands, you know, finding ways to tune into that, because it doesn't have to be this thing that's just so out there and weird. I think people do things all the time that are quote unquote normal, <laughs> that cleanse and clear, and people do this all the time. One of the ways I like to do it, I mean, there's a lot of things I do to clear energy. <sighs> One of the things I do a lot is just any form of movement. And when I say just clearing your energy field, sometimes it's just something like you wake up in the morning and you feel like something like dense and gross in your body. Like you feel it's not always like this weird oh, mystical thing around you. Like, it's like you wake up, you feel dense. How do I create movement? Like you wake up and there's like stagnation. So movement is just this way to really clear and cleanse. And um, it can be so many kinds of kinds of movement, um, you know, running, exercise. One really awesome way is like stomping your feet or shaking or like shaking your hands and your shoulders and your feet and just like really creating like vigorous movement. And that really like, <laughs> I'm like shaking as I, <laughs> as I talk about this. Um, it just really creates this, you know, movement in your body. And that's, you know, such a helpful way to keep energy moving and flowing. And another way I think is really fun and awesome is forms of dance as a movement. I was loving, you know, it's, it's cleaning your aura, but also it's just dispelling, it's dispelling negativity or like these lower dense emotions. You know, if you feel like, oh, like these horrible weighted things are on your heart, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of ways to talk about that. Like, it's not like movement is going to heal everything. But it does help, you know, to move around and like move those centers. And it's it's definitely a step, you know, a step that really helps. Yeah. I mean, I feel like when you're moving, like you're 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 like shaking things out. Like someone told me once, like if you watch a dog and after they've had a fight or they've had a conflict of any sort, they'll just start it, they'll just shake it off completely. Like and almost every animal does that. And that tremoring and shaking is a way to get um, all the chemicals that have accumulated in your body from fear or anxiety to be, you know, moved. So it's very mammalian, but we've been kind of socialized to sit still, you know, a little bit, not be that expressive. So yeah, shake. And literally there's a song, shake it off, shake it off. Oh my gosh. So many. There's like, (laughs) no, it's good. Shake your tail feathers. I was like... (laughs) I think there's like a million like Mariah Carey has a shake it off song. Taylor Swift has like a shake it out song. Like there's a reason shaking things out is in popular yeah. culture. Come on. Let me see you shake your tail. Feathers. Exactly. Come on. <laughs> All right. So we got that. We're practicing energy hygiene by shaking, uh, doing a little, what is that thing? That dance you do where you straighten your legs and you twerk. <laughs> you can twerk it off. Twerk I mean- it off. Go, that's a throwback to like five years ago. <laughs> it's really like whatever you need to do to like get things moving. <laughs> you know, and like speaking of that, laughter is a huge way to clear. Laughter is a massive way to clear energy. Everyone thinks that you have to be like, if you're like a spiritual person, you need to be so serious and so solemn all the time. And there is a place for that. Like there is a place for like deep, deep reverence. And there is such a place for that. But also there is a place for laughter and humor. And laughter is such a way to dispel negativity. And I think it's really healthy for our energetic fields and for our auras to to laugh. It's like It's like if something just really awful comes into your field or like in, you know, I use these words, but like, if let you know, you're sad about something or whatever. There's like nothing better than putting on a, like a movie or like 
talking to a friend and just like laughing about it. Like, ha ha ha, like really laughing is so good. It's so nice. It's so healthy for us. It's so, um, it's just such an awesome practice. Um, and everyone, you know, people again, naturally do this. Okay. So we've got movement and we've got laughter. Uh, when you're walking down the street, like if you're walking down the street in LA or you're walking down the street in New York, do you do practices then? I do different things. So let's say if I'm walking down the street of New York, I do protection practices. So let's say like clearing might be like laughter, sound. Um, oh, sound is another one. <laughs> like making like meditation or um, like, I mean, meditation is an awesome way to clear energy. There's a difference between clearing your energy and protecting your energy. So you want to clear things out first. And then from there, you want to create a kind of protection around you. When I walk down the streets of New York City, I'm so sensitive. So I, I'm always imagining myself with some kind of um, light around me. And really, actually, whenever I leave the house, I, I pray. I have a prayer practice and I'm always, I have a relationship with God. So it's, I mean, but it's really whoever you feel inclined to have that relationship with. I can only talk about what I do for my own protection. I pray. I ask God, you know, I ask God for protection. I ask that angels be with me as I walk through the streets. I ask that every moment of of my day is guided and protected. And so it's all like a prayer invocation. I always pray. So I do that like first and foremost. That's just what I do. And then when I'm wa- walking down the street, I always imagine a kind of a, like a white light around me. And when I engage with other people, I, I imagine a white light around them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I even imagine light surrounding both of us. So it's not really like a separation thing. It's just it's just that whatever comes forward be for both of our highest goods and transmuted into the light and kind of just create a sacred space between you and whoever it is that you're dealing with. And also to protect yourself around people that might not have um, healthy ways of expressing themselves. And, you know, if you're a sensitive person and really any person, like it can be easy to absorb those things. I want to do a little aside on the God thing, because I, I feel like there's this whole religious trauma that has taken people out of the capacity, a lot of people in the middle a lot of out of the capacity to use the word God. And so they replace it with spirit or energy or love or joy because it got sort of patriarchal overlay of a white guy in the sky. But that's such a simplistic fairy tale childhood understanding of that. So um, I like the idea of sort of alignment to a greater force and, and like knowing that you have, that your words have power and that your intentions have power and that people read that on you. Like if I walk down the street, a crabby, crabby person, that's evident in every aspect of my physicality. That's evident in the way I look at people, et cetera. And also if I walk in confidence and, and hold myself in a certain way, or if I walk with loving gaze, that's also a palpable thing. So we're, we're clearing out and then we're um, doing sort of an invocation of protection and as you're, uh, I think you write about this in the book too, like doing these protection rituals and, and things. What about if you are coming into a space with someone who's in your family or in your uh, work circle who has, who's difficult for you in general or who has ill intent? Are there extra things you do there? If you know you're going into a situation where it's targeted. Yeah, you know, it's challenging. How do you keep how do I keep my heart open to someone I love, but they hurt me? Mm. Or how do I keep my heart open to someone I love, but this isn't healthy for me? Like, in some ways, the topic of boundaries might come up for something like this. It depends on who you're dealing with. If you're dealing with a toxic, like, workspace, you know, you might want to question, like, why, why am I allowing this? Why do I continue to allow myself to be in a position where I'm being abused. But you know, that can also be really complicated. So it's not always so cut and dry. Like, there's no amount of like, I have like 20 fields of armor energy around me. But if you're not learning how to say no to unhealthy 
situations, there's no amount of sage that's going to help you with that. <laughs> okay, well, no amount of sage is, okay, that's true. I, I have learned, like, there are certain people, if I can stand across the room from them, or like, you know, just add a little bit more physical space, it helps me like be with them. But also like, maybe that's a person I only deal with on the phone. I don't have to see them in person. I had a great teacher uh, in my ex-husband. And what he would do, if someone yelled at him, if anyone raised their voice to him, he learned in therapy that the minute you raise your voice, I leave. And that very quickly people got trained that they could not raise their voice to him without him opting out. He says, I do not have to accept or receive that. So that was a helpful teaching uh, for me. But we do talk about smudging and cleansing in the book. Let's not put down sage. You wrote this whole section on smudging and cleansing. Oh, I know. But the thing is that it's very, it's a beautiful practice. It's such a beautiful practice. It's just that it's just that it, it's not a replacement for boundaries, in my opinion. It's not a replacement for like learning how to say no or like learning how to respect yourself. That's a very powerful form of protection is learning to say no, learning how to say, I'm not going to allow someone to raise their voice to me. And like, um, I think you mentioned it before, you know, boundaries don't have to be this cut and dry, like harsh thing. It's something that allows more love to come through. Because when you respect yourself and when you honor yourself, that's when you're able to create these connections with other people. It's it's really unhealthy to be able to be like someone's wet towel. That's that's no way to create love. Like love love your neighbor as you love yourself, you know? Like that's the golden rule. Yeah, people forget the love yourself part. They forget the love yourself part and you can't you can't it doesn't have to be this like, oh, I I walk around with this like armor. There's like levels of boundaries. There's rigid boundaries and there's healthy boundaries. You know, it's really important. That's a very important practice. We talk about the, just on that note, this isn't in your section. It's one of the components of the book that I wrote. It's about the nightly ritual of, of clearing and appreciation that you do with your partner. And I've been doing this with Call for a while, probably six years or something. I think we learned it six years ago. And every night you go, you have any grievances, anything that needs to clear? And if it's a really lightweight, yeah, you know, this thing happened today and it irritated me, then you can clear it at the minute. And if it's something larger, then you go, oh, that one sounds like it needs bigger. And you make a time when you're fresher to clear it. But then after that, you do the nightly appreciations. So it's almost the same idea in between a couple. And the appreciation part is so beautiful. This guy, Tabor Shadburn, taught us about it. And it's not like, oh, you've got pretty eyes, or you're so hot, or you're, you're so kind. It's specific examples from that day. Like I noticed today that you got the groceries and unloaded them. And I was really appreciative of that because I was in the middle of something and I felt cared for. Or um, I, I liked the way uh, your shirt reflected your eyes and I really noticed it over lunch. You know, just like very, uh, very specific, noticeable things that happened that day. And what ends up happening as you do that practice over time is that you store them up during the day so that you can say them, you know, or what was beautiful to you today if you aren't together. So I feel like you can extrapolate the clearing and the appreciation to a lot of other areas of life. Yeah, that's so beautiful. What I love about that is um, it really puts you in a place of gratitude, which keeps you in your heart space. And that's that's such a wonderful place to be is just to like really cultivate love. You know, you just reminded me, you know, it's so important to honor honor those feelings that we have and to spend time each day kind of placing our hands on our hearts and being like, well, how did I feel today? How do I feel right now? How, how are you body? You know, placing your hand, you know, just checking in with yourself and seeing what feelings come up and feeling your feelings is another way to clear and feel. And then I just love that appreciation piece because it just puts you right into love right into a state of love, which is the greatest form of protection. Okay. I know, I know a lot of you don't take drugs, so apologize ahead of time. But if you've ever had MDMA or ecstasy or white <laughs> lily or Kana, I said to him, we got in some like irritation thing. I said, you know what? 
if you're going to talk to me, could you just talk to me like you're on ecstasy? That's funny. <laughs> and it was like, it was like a reference point, a total reference point for all of a sudden you're like, oh, I remember what that's like. Oh, you're a magical fairy being. And I just love you so much. And I'm flooded with endorphins and nothing could make me mad if I wanted it to be. <laughs> even, be even doing that, that became a, a, a mimetic thing for us. Like, talk to me like you're on E. Oh my God. That's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> That's so funny. That's my relationship tip for the day. You know what? Okay? It's whatever gets you. I mean, if it, if it keeps you in a love space and a, <laughs> you know, forgiveness space and a, a adoration space, <laughs> I'm not going to endorse or not endorse MD, like <laughs> drug usage. Or I know. Usage, you know what? Okay. Um, as a, as for my ladies and gentlemen who are not about the drug usage, I will tell a short outtake here which is I was really struggling with overcoming a trauma that I was like waking up and having nightmares for from being attacked when I was younger and it would stuck with me. And so I finally was like, I really hate this dream. And, um, and I heard about a guy who was doing psychedelic assisted psychotherapy way back when, like 10 years ago, but he was working with MDMA. He wasn't working with psilocybin or anything else. And so I went to that session and this is the way it worked. They give you they talk to you about what's going on the night before. The next morning around 8.30, they give you a dose. And then as you start to um, experience the medicine coming on, they begin in interviewing you and asking you to look at that situation. And what's happening with the drug is that it's flooding your brain with your own serotonin. It's not doing anything to bring in um, to change your perceptions or anything like that. It's just your own ser You're getting like a, a, a big dump of your own serotonin. It's like releasing the floodgates. Uh, literally, it opens the gating uh, mechanism in the brain. So we're in the endocrine system. So as that comes on, you don't have any fear left in your body. And so you can look at any situation from a new perspective, not as you were a child, but you can look at that situation as an adult. So you do this thing. When it's done, you go to sleep. They give you the recording. The next day, you have a debrief. And then I never had that issue again in my life. Not one time. It does, and that's what they're finding with veterans and other people who had serious traumas. So, you know, I feel like there's some situations where people use it as a club drug or whatever, but that, but with, with marital therapy, with trauma therapy, any place where there's like a lot of buildup of fear, anxiety, tension, resentment, that it's a really powerful intervention. And I don't take it lightly because I like to live really clean and sober, but for certain purposes, really amazing. And there are herbals that do that that aren't scheduled. Uh, White lily is one of them. There are a few more. That's my aside on how to get to the reference point. Yeah, very, so. very... Um Awesome, interesting information. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I took us off topic. <laughs> oh, I know. I love I it. I took us off topic a little bit, but you know, but I feel like that's like an intern. If you have a, a trauma that's in your body, like a big frozen lump of, of bad memory that you had to like seal up when you were when it happened and then never look at it, that's like that's living in your body. So I feel that is part of self-protection and energy clearing is to like go through and comb those out. Yeah, absolutely. Like tr trauma work. That's a whole that's a whole thing. That's like a whole universe of ways to heal trauma. I'm not going to talk too much about psychedelic use because I'm I just don't I don't have a lot of experience with it, but if it is working for somebody and, you know, it seems like there's a lot of interesting stuff about microdosing that seems really promising. So, yeah, there is. I, I feel there's a lot of, there are a lot of things that seem promising and, you know, there are companies like Mind Bloom. It's a, it's it literally they can, they're advertising at clinical activities like this now. They have posters all over New York. People are getting their psychologists and psychiatrists are adding psychedelic therapy to their CVs. But let's go back to the detoxification and clean living and treating your body with love. There have been almost no studies on long arc effects on your liver or your kidneys or your systems of elimination from having microdosing in your body every day. And, you know, that's still a lot to clear out. It's still a fungus, you know. Mushrooms are fungi. I'm not sure that you want to ingest those day to daily, but you know, over time they seem to have a great performance effect. But we don't have a lot of long, longitudinal studies on how they impact the systems. But those will come. 
I trust those will come. Yeah, it's a really exciting form of research right now. I actually just watched the show on Netflix called Nine Perfect Strangers about this. <laughs> it's a, it was a really good. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to go find that. That along with, I, someone told me, I've, I've got a list now if I ever get around writing this book and getting it out the door on top of my other two jobs has been a total joy, but it's definitely not left any room for Netflix. So I will uh, get to that. I'll get to that in my in my spare time. Nine Perfect Strangers, Nicole Kidman, Retreat Center, Psychedelics, <laughs> lots of drama. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's great. <laughs> okay. Well, we're we're going to um in the Maria Haddad, who in in the book writes on rituals of self-protection. She also writes about how love is the greatest self-protection. And she's got a section in there on smudging. And I think a little bit on on crystal and minerals and stuff like that. But I want to just appreciate you so much for writing it, for the beauty you create in the world every day. You've been instrumental to Rosebud getting off the ground. We wouldn't be here with this beautiful design if it wasn't for you. And the fact that we could be on this journey together, you know, where we like wake up and light candles and say prayers and then go off and do badass things in the world. I love that combination mm -hmm. that it lives together. Yeah. I feel like the, 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 we're moving into a phase of society where you can have both. You can be next age with the way you feel the interdependence and connective field, and you can go out and get shit done. And that they're not polarities, they're an integration and a complementary way of being. Uh, one last question for you. If you had one wish for the world or the women of the world, depending on how you want to answer it, this is our go-to question, what would it be? What would be your hope? It would be amazing if people could tune in to the light within themselves, to the fact that who they are is a very, very loving person. And everybody has this light within themselves, but we live in a world that creates a lot of difficulty, a lot of obstructions to that love. I just really think that that's the core of who we all are. And it would be amazing if everyone had that connection to their higher nature and their true nature. And also if they could see that nature and everybody else and in the world around them and the way that we're all so interconnected with each other and the earth around us, you know, that would be my wish. It would be a wish if, if it manifested, that would change everything. It's really hard to hurt people when they're part of you. And, and we are all part of each other. We are all sharing breath in the same space. We are all sharing the same water. We are all doing this. Separation is an illusion. Mm. I'm reminded of uh, India Ari's song, you know, I am light, I am light. I that am one. Light, I am light. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's so lovely. That song. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I really look forward to seeing where you go to next with the plants and the ceremonies and all the beautiful stuff you're working on in the world. And thank you again for being part of the book project. And anybody out there who hasn't had a chance, please um, please go and look up the reverence book at rosewoman.com and uh, see if it's something that might be for you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do hope you come out and take a look at Reverence, Creating Ritual and Daily Life, our book. And I also want to invite you to something very special. If you're listening to this around the time of its actual release on November 13th, which is a Saturday in 2021, we are doing a party online uh, for the birthday of Rosebud. And I have such fantastic women joining me from Suzanne Sterling, the co-founder of Off the Mat, the founder of Voice of Change, leading drumming and vocalization and movement, to Nicole Hodges on BDSM as a gateway to awakening, to Dr. Susan Hardwick-Smith on Turn On uh, throughout your life cycles, people on relationships, uh, people on retail, people on finding your mission and purpose, people who are going to give us sort of state of the union on uh, women's equity questions. I'm just really super excited. There's poetry, there's music. Please come to rosewoman.com 
and RSVP. It's free. You know, I ran tons of TEDx events and I did something called What is Exquisite and I ran a salon and I have a lot of book things and community gatherings and this is one of my favorite things to do and if it was in person we'd have even more fun um, in our embodiment but Zoom is as good as we're going to get this year so Rosebud's third birthday kind of exciting sensuality, sexuality, equity and reverence on November 13th, 2021 Come find me at the.rose.woman on Instagram or at Rosebud Woman for my company. May you be healthy. May you be whole. May you be forever well and loved.